All right, it looks like we might be live. YouTube hasn't officially told me that yet, but if you're here with us live, hi, I am Sheeta D from Sheeta's on the Loose, and I am here with Raina Sargent of Hooky Wellness and Burnout Whisperer. Hey, Raina. Hey, girl. How's it going? Hey, hey. I get so nervous when we start because I've legitimately never had a YouTube live go the way it's supposed to go, so I'm always like... What is we doing? It looks like, but I think we might be live. Okay, so let me. You two guys officially told me that yet, but if you're here, sorry, I'm editing out of that window. Yes, we are live. Boom, it happened. Yay! I'm gonna take air horns. Okay, thank you for being with me here today. I really want to get you here because I know that burnout is your focus, and burnout for a lot of people I work with is the starting point. But it's a cry. It's kind of a crappy starting point. It's okay if we swear here, just FYI, because I'm going. To Thank you. All right. <laughs> no, don't worry about that. Um, yeah, it's a kind of shitty starting point. So if you, I get people who are also who are as clients who are frequently tired and frustrated and want to quit their job. Um, and while I fully support that, <laughs> quit that damn job, I also want them to know that. Uh, there are things they can do before they get to that point. And if they're at that point, there are things they can do before, if they're planning a career break, bef during the career break planning phase, there are healthy ways they can deal with the burnout. But let's rewind. Let's rewind a little bit. Let's talk about you. How did you become the burnout whisperer? I kept burning out. <laughs> I didn't put down guardrails or boundaries because that was not something I was raised to understand. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Detroit. I've been a, a domestic nomad, I say, for the past 18 years. Jeez, I age myself. Uh, but I built my career in brand management and innovation and had amazing opportunities working uh, companies like Nestle and Intuit on brands that are a large part of people's lives. And so while academia and professional experience has always been like my goals and the things that I value is that progression and achievement. A couple years back, I was at, um, I, I was in an environment that turned toxic. And the first thing I know how to do is just work harder. Like opportunities, quote unquote opportunities were presenting themselves. And it's like, oh my God, it's right in front of me. If I just work harder, then I will get there. And then the harder I work, the further it was. And so at that point, I just completely burned out. And I like this chapter of my story started with me at the kitchen island with my husband working. And then I just started crying. Like that was it. I was just like exhausted because no matter what I did, I was going, I was having like 15 hour days. It was a lot. And so it's funny that you talk about quitting your job because one of the first things I did, like most, is let's go get a different job. Uh, that's, that's what we do. Something's wrong. You recognize something's wrong with the situation. So you change the clear situation that you have the power to change, but that internal stuff still goes. And so for me, I did not like how I felt. And then I also had the layer of life lifing is what I would say, because burnout does not happen in isolation. The rest of your life does not stop progressing. So personally for me, I had, I was also dealing with moving multiple times and an aging ailing father and uh, dealing with a, he was dealing with a battle with cancer and just family dynamics and internal value. And so when I stepped back and started to understand, oh, this is burnout. I was like, I just noticed around me, everyone's burning out, everybody. And we we're just walking around in denial of, oh, that's just a toxic person or that's just a bad manager or they will never know how to communicate or this and that and making up excuses or just, just believing this is a person's being rather than the situation has caused them to be like this. And so I left tech in November of 19 to start my company, Hookie Wellness. And so I'm building Hookie as a mental wellness platform that I'm connecting the world's people pillars to the expert education and support they need to beat burnout. Um, that is really what I am working to do because burnout is a cycle. Burnout is not something that only happens to a chosen few. Burnout, the whole world is burning out. So we need real solutions to help people wherever they are on their burnout journey. And so I'm doing my part to help because burnout is trash and we need to stop acting like it doesn't exist and start doing something about it. Okay, now that was a mouthful when you described mm -hmm. what you do. Can you like simplify that for us for people who don't speak mental wellness? 
Absolutely. Um, so I support individuals in teams through workshops, courses, classes, and will ultimately pay off in individual support. Um, and so mental wellness is an all-inclusive arena. I'm just going to jump to it. Oh, this was, I was like, I'm just going to jump to it. So we often think about the, the mental space as just mental health and we automatically go therapy. And so therapy is great. It is a foundation of of repairing burnout. I always say start a therapy, but also through my interviews and clients, I recognize therapy isn't for everybody and it isn't for all stages of burnout, not necessarily. And so when you look at the world of mental health and it actually is a little bit larger with mental wellness. And so I'm really lucky. I'm on the mental wellness association with the Global Wellness Institute. So the people doing the research. So anything about it, I can find you a white paper and help the knowledge is exciting. But the way I slim it down to mental wellness is four pillars. The first pillar is growth. So growth is where you find mental health, your traditional therapy, coaching, those deep introspection tools and resources is the growth pillar. For me, in my perspective, everything starts and stops with the growth pillar. If your foundation isn't strong, everything else can fall apart. The next pillar of that is rest, which is really exciting because that's starting to get a lot of conversation right now. But the rest pillar is more than just sleeping. It's rest rejuvenation. So that is where you truly do get the relaxation and the sleeping. But that's also where mindfulness, meditation, and some of those sensorial wellness. So aromatherapy, sound baths, that type of stuff that's popping up, that's or getting some, some, some wind behind its wings, that's under the rest pillar. Then you have play, which is one of my favorite pillars. Uh, play is where creativity comes alive. And so often once we become adults, creativity and play is the first thing that goes because it doesn't make us money. Um, and so that's one of the strongest pillars that we need to bring back. And then last is community because that's the thing that's often overlooked. So as you look across mental wellness and how do we even start to think about approaching burnout, it is bigger than just taking a vacation. It is bigger than just taking off of work. It is a comprehensive, holistic approach to life. And the four pillars of mental wellness, grow, rest, play, and community are the anchors and my recommendations to evaluate which pieces you need to bring back in your life. Okay, we're gonna have to break that. We're gonna have to break down your breakdown in a minute. But I wanted anyone who's watching and has a question about burnout um, to drop it in the comments and we'll write and we'll answer it. We are here to help you guys. Um, I know once you start talking, when you start talking about your story about burnout, right now, one of the things I remember about mine was I was in a situation where I did everything I could to win, to do the right, to do excellent work, to be like top not bitch at work. Like I was doing it, but I didn't realize that no matter how hard you work, you will never win if they don't want you to win. Like there, mm -hmm. there's no amount like, and so it felt like I'm pushing that ball of the, the, the rock up the hill every day and the rock rolls over me. Like at least two or three times a week, something disrespectful as hell happens. Yep. And that rock rolls over me and I'm like, well, I guess it's time to put more shoulder in that, push that rock harder. Mm -hmm. and so. That, that burnout story sounds so familiar to me because it was like, why, why isn't what I'm doing when I'm doing an excellent job? Why isn't what I'm doing enough? And it's like, oh, you don't want it to be. Okay, wait, someone said my chat's not working. Uh-oh. I tell you, it's always something. I tell oh, you. technology. Technology. But that's exciting because somebody want to ask a question, so I'm here for it. Um, then, while you're figuring out, I can take a step back and just talk about burnout in general and set a little bit of the tone because um, there's some misperceptions because a lot of people talk about burnout. And right now I use the phrase, it's sort of like greenwashing. Like everyone's just like, I'm burned out, I'm burned out. And we're starting to flip it and make it seem like it's a badge of honor and it's not. So I always say burnout is not a badge nor a burden. First off, it's just, it just exists. And so when you look at it in the purest sense, the definition is the state of emotional, physical and mental exhaustion that is caused by excessive and prolonged stress. So that is the, the textbook definition. Emotional, physical, mental exhaustion caused by excessive and prolonged stress. It is not an acute thing. This does not come out of the blue. This is not like, oh my God, oh, I'm all of a sudden burned out. No, you've been working on it for weeks, months, sometimes years. Um, and so 
as I started to get into my deep research, the, the grandfather coined the term uh, burnout. He said something really prolific that I, I really like. And so it's to wear oneself out by striving to reach an unrealistic goal set by oneself or society. And it's like, oh, that's really like tactical because when you break it down and it's like unrealistic goal by oneself or one society. And so the realist, unrealistic goal could be unrealistic from the start Mm -hmm. or it could become unrealistic over time. Um, and so there's also the two layers is can be caused by yourself or caused by that gap with society. So in hearing what you said about pushing that, that boulder up here, which girl, we all do that one of like, this should be enough because it's, mm -hmm. it's great. And it should, great should be enough. And it's enough for other people standing in the same, and it's, this is enough work for other people who are in my shoes, but it's not enough me yeah so yeah yeah that one well we're gonna come back to that one okay. uh, when it comes to the expectations one of the things I always like to say especially when we get into some of these jobs where it's like you get cold you get sold on something you're like super hype and excited and like oh I'm gonna get in here move up the ladder and blah 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 blah. you get a couple moves and then all of a sudden you're stalled and exactly what you said like why are they moving and I'm not moving and so sometimes it's organizational bs Sometimes it's just organizational bullshit. Sometimes it's individual bullshit of your managers and leaders. And sometimes you hit a point where you have to reevaluate the expectations of where you are, where you're trying to go, and where you're trying to go, where, where you're at. So like, I have, uh, I was talking to a client and she, it is really interesting because I've seen this story play out so many times. She has this direct report and she's like trying so hard to support this direct report, but it becomes very clear direct reports not going to be able, she was like, I cannot put my, I cannot vouch for you. Like I cannot vouch mm -hmm. for you. And so the direct report, instead of paying attention to the feedback that was given, which was, this is exactly what I need you to do. I need you to do this from there. So this, this, I use this example because this even happens when there's good managers involved. And it's just, you're in a situation where things won't change. And it was like, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Like this person ended up being on pips. And it's like, but for that individual in that situation, it was, but I'm working hard, but I'm working hard, but I'm working hard and I deserve it. And it's like, yeah, to a certain extent you do deserve it. But to get you there, if your team has actually laid out goals and expectations and you're not delivering on it, Maybe, or you're you're no longer have the energy to deliver on it because you've given so much thus far. Take a step back and say, do I really want this? Yeah. Can I do this? Like yeah. we we so often just get into the spiral of like I deserve it that you forget you don't even want it anymore. Like it just becomes a matter yes. of pride. And I'm not saying walk away from your goals by any means, but sometimes your goals have shifted before you recognize it, and you will just make your situ you can make your situation worse. So that's where and you have some self-control in it. It's easy to get stuck in that this feels right. This feels like, or like for me as a lawyer, it was like, well, I went to law school to be a lawyer. So I'm here. Sure. No fucking lawyer. Like what? Uh, there's there's no way. Yeah. These student loan bills don't get to say that, it, you know, I get to walk away. And so it took a long time for me to say, okay, enough is enough. Yep. Yeah, same for me. There are some, like when you're dealing with burnout, sometimes it's like, oh, I need to completely change things. But sometimes it's like, I need to change some small things. I need to add in some behaviors. So a little more education. I just jump in. I love, I'm just love sharing the information because it just, for me, information, I can start to pull things, self-identify and figure out what works for me. That is what I equip because everyone's burnout situation is different. And every burnout episode is different. Burnout is a cycle. So it's all about breaking the cycle, recognizing when your cycle's starting to speed up so you can reverse it or slow it down. Burnout is something that happens over life multiple times based on situations. And based, like I focus on workplace burnout, but you can burn out relationships. Caregiver burnout is a huge space. Ser like um, per service provider burnout is a huge space. There's burnout on all these levels. It's where you're committing yourself to and a lot of your time and energy. So I focus on workplace, but just be aware it can happen in different parts of your life. Um, sorry, I, I, I got on a I got on a soapbox again. <laughs> it, it is, I think I think well, good because I think I fixed the comments, girl. Okay, um, and they are rolling in. Um, okay. But before we get there, before we go there, so you guys keep them coming. 
I want to ask you like the first actual question on my list because we haven't even gotten there yet. I just started throwing it at you. I was like, okay. We just, boom, 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 boom. All right. Um, how can someone who feels stress and tension in their life, at work, at home, et cetera, is it possible for them to self-diagnose burnout and what would that look like? Yeah, great question. Um, so there's a lot packed in there. So when you use the word diagnosed, diagnosed typically comes with like true conditions. Burnout mm -hmm. is a syndrome. So there's no technical way to officially okay. diagnose. There are scales and indicators that can give you an idea, but uh, diagnose, like if you look across the research, they're saying there's no real way to diagnose. So stepping back, cause that doesn't really help you, but you can start to assess. There are some clear things that start to fall in uh, to burnout. And what the biggest thing you can do to understand if you are dealing with burnout is to pay attention to yourself and self-awareness. Sounds simple, sounds straightforward, but truly is it. And so that is where the space of journaling, writing down how you're feeling, paying attention how you're feeling truly does help. And it doesn't have to be journaling. Like, it's funny, I, I'm very like business-minded. I, I moved into the wellness space. And so there are parts of the wellness that I'm like, that's a little for fruit. No, give, I am very type A, like give me facts, give me figures, and, but journaling, is, is productive. And so joining on the sense of paying attention to uh, physical things, emotional things, and mental things that are coming up. So are you feeling exhausted on a daily? Is it harder and harder to get out of bed? It, are you sleeping less and less regardless of what you're doing? Like even if you're taking melatonin, even if you're setting bedtimes, like is sleep a problem? So understanding what are those things that are not flukes, but our consistent trends over time will start to help you understand if you're dealing with like small stress or if this is more of a longer term situation. To help with this is always talking to a therapist. So a therapist will help you understand, hey, you might be dealing with burnout or actually there might be some deeper things because you said this earlier, burnout is a start. And for me, like burnout, burnout can camouflage some other shit. Let me just say that. Burnout camouflages it. And for people who, if you're like myself, who likes to do the most, always had a life of doing the most because that's what we do, you get used to suppressing some of your feelings and ignoring it or working through it. And so what happens with burnout, especially when you get to the more intense stages of it, your buffers are gone. So you know how when you're at work and like, oh, I had a situation, I've had this situation, but you know how you have your manager and then all of a sudden your manager is gone and you're like, oh my God, there's so much shit that they were keeping away from me that I, like they were my buffer. Dealing, like when you are not dealing with intense stages of burnout, you have more of a personal buffer. You're able to keep balls in the air no matter how much stress comes in. But if you're intense burnout, later stages, which we can talk about the stages, your buffer is depleted. So it's just like when your manager's out of the office and all of a sudden you're getting hit up by VP's presidents asking you for bullshit that you're like, what is happening? That's what's happening when you're, when you're, when you're like real full on burnout is like the buffer you had and being able to do the most all the time is less and less. And so you're feeling the impact of things that may have you never addressed in childhood or the, what I call paper cuts of workplace trauma or the things that you're used to ignoring or being able to be like, brush it off. You're not able to do it because burnout can create this feeling of, or can basically make people walk around like an exposed nerve where everything comes at you. Those things you're used to ignoring, those things you're used to brushing off. You have no patience, no, no time, yeah. no energy. And so that's a, that is where you start to pay attention. Are you, are you changing? Are you, are you fundamentally changing? Even if the same stuff is happening around you, that's like the difference, especially with stress burnout. Cause stress is like short term. You, you just need to sleep every now, now and then burnout is like, you are having some internal value shifts, some personality shifts, the same shit ain't kicking the same way. Like that's more burnout. That's like, okay, hey therapist, hey girl, I thought this was a fluke, but I am seeing this over time and I wanna start talking about what could be underneath this. Does that help? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. And Krishan just said you hit the nail on the head with the exposed nerve. Cause I sure. think, I know I was like, yes, that was, <laughs> woo. And it looks like some of our audience did too. Oh, that's good. Before we, go, um, before we go any further, I want to ask, um, and I know, we, I believe you said burnout was a symptom. Um, I want to ask, what is the difference between 
burnout and depression? How do these two different, how do they manifest in different ways? And what are the different ways we should be coping with them? Absolutely. Yep. So let me also just state something. I'm not a therapist. I don't want to be a therapist. They're really good at their job. I don't want to do it because it's hard. Um, what I am is someone who is burned out and was tired of it and was like, I need to deeply understand what this is. And I'm talking to all the experts around me and surrounding myself with the team so that I can start to share this education. So everything is a matter of reading, research, talking to experts. So when I share stuff, I'm passing it along. Um, so I'm always careful, especially when we talk about real mental health things, talk to a licensed therapist when it gets into the weeds and the real stuff of like, what should I deeply do in my personal situation? So with burnout and depression, those are different. Uh, depression can be a symptom of burnout. So when you get into burnout, we often pe people are starting to talk about burnout um, like, oh, I'm burned out. I'm gonna just take this like this two week vacation and I'll be all back together. If you're truly burned out, that's not gonna work. Burnout is a scale of the spectrum. I break it down into five stages. So I use like a plant metaphor just because I like to make stuff easy. So I don't know about you, but you got the green babies around. I like to use a fiddle leaf because uh, that shit is hard to keep alive. So imagine you have a fiddle leaf and it's like thriving. So it's the leaves are all shiny. It's like growing, you're sprouting new leaves. The soil is wet, you're good. Roots are strong and growing. That is thriving. Everyone wants to be there. That's not common. <laughs> just, just the way our society is built. It's very hard to stay in thriving long-term. Then you start to progress and that's where you get into the dry stage. So your soil is a little dry. That's where it's like, you're starting to wreck, you're starting to double down on work. Like dirt, work is starting to take over and it's starting to drain more of you. Once again, I look at workplace burnout. So it's whatever you're committing to is taking more of you. So go ahead. What's the name of the stage? That is dry. Dry? Okay. Once again, plant metaphor. All right. Um, so this is your soils dry. So when you're in that, you're starting to double down on work. You're starting to get a little tired. What can you do? Water the soil. So that's where like the lighter self-care can come in. You occasionally take a bath, do some self-care in the physical sense, start some mindfulness meditation. If you're in those early stages, that's where like preventative, especially smaller lifestyle things add up because they hold you, they keep you there. They can stop it from accelerating or progressing. Then you start to get into the not so fun stages. This is where it's like full, you're starting to really be exhausted. I call this, um, this is wilting. So that's when the leaves start to wilt. And so you're like, oh, oh, okay. When you see your fiddle leaves will, will like start to wilt, you're like, wait, what is happening? Something is, something's off. In real life, that's where we start to pay attention. In a perfect world, we would have paid attention in the first two and started doing something. But then we start to pay attention. But if you're like many, and I would say myself, you don't stop, you just figure it out and work a little harder. So that's where sleep starts to get in. You're starting to look at some of the false cures. That's where like, if you, you might be up in your alcohol or up in your cannabis, like those false cures to make the other stuff go away. Um, that next stage, the next two, the final two stages, I'm trying to keep everybody from there. And I am like, the reason I built my company is to keep people out of these stages or to bring them back because they are bullshit. So the next one is where you start to shrivel. That's where detachment can start to come in. The people you used to hang with, people you want to talk to, things you used to do, you don't want to do none of it. And so this is where the starting points of like, is this burnout? Is this depression start to come in? Because you're starting to pull away. That last stage, I just call it replant. If you get to that final stage, I, I have been there as a recovered stage five burnout. Um, that's where your whole house of cards can start to fall apart because your complete buffer is gone. Everything you've been suppressing can come to light. So your therapist and you can become best friends in this period of like, oh, I thought I just hated my job or my manager, but I realized, oh, the reason they can bother me is because they make me think about these experiences of workplace trauma over these years. And those experiences, oh shit, Let's talk about family. So that's how it can really start to uncover and unpack some of the bigger, bigger things. So I love how you said earlier, burnout being the start, because it truly can open up and it gets you more comfortable. If you start to tackle your burnout, you can start to tackle the other things in life that really can help you get to that next 
chapter and get you to that place where you feel more grounded and sense of self. So you go from thriving, beautiful green leaves, shiny leaves of fiddle tree to replant. But the thing is, there's things you can do all around. And even if you can replant, go get another plot. And sometimes you might need to go get another plant. But the thing is, that's not the end of the cycle. You can start over. You can always do something. And so with Burnett, it's a matter of understanding it. So I threw a lot at you, uh, but I will be releasing on Monday a tool that will help you understand and start to assess what stage you might be in based on your symptoms and signs. So there's help on the way. And that tool will be on hookywellness.com? Correct. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and pretend I can type and put that in there. Okay, so you mentioned that there are phases. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, there are steps you can take along the way when you're in these phases. So can you let us know what steps, like if I am thriving, st stage one, I'm thriving, what should I be doing to make sure that I don't make it to step two? So, okay, when it comes to the cycles, phases, stages, whatever you want to call it um, at that time, everyone's, as I said, situation can be different. So some people will go straight from one to four and be like, whatever that situation is so intense can just accelerate you to further stages. So everyone doesn't go through every single stage. It's personal, but the symptoms and okay. are pretty consistent, just so you know. Stage one and stage two, my recommendation is whatever you're doing, keep doing that. That's really preventative care. That is a matter of, I will always go back to look at the four pillars, growth, rest, play, community, start to assess where you're feeling a little low. In stage one or stage two, you might be able to self-recognize, I haven't connected with anyone just for fun. COVID does that. So there's a lot of that happening because of just by nature of what's happening. But that doesn't mean community and connection is not important. It is more important than ever. So in those early stages, that's like get, make sure you're talking to, to a friend every two weeks and someone just checking on you. Like that's that simple, like preventative maintaining where you are. That is finding a wellness activity and something you can physically let off steam. Like moving your body is huge. Uh, that connection between mind, body, regardless of what stage it is, if you do nothing else, move, like move your body. Um, but early on, that's where truly like self-care, journaling, paying attention to self, paying attention if there's changes. That in those early stages, preventative, paying attention to yourself is number one. And just keep doing that stuff. When you get to the later ones, if you're finding you're in stage four where you're detaching, where you're cynical and everybody sucks at work, that is where you have to really assess like how much change is needed. So if you pay attention to mental health, you can you you may have heard therapists talk about like trauma in the sense of little t, big t. Are you familiar with that at all? Mm -hmm. So for those who may not, big T, that's the trauma that we often talk about. That's like real severe trauma. Um, little t is, I liken it to paper cuts. Those shit that happen every day that we sometimes ignore, whether they're personal, professional, those are ones that you can ignore. When you look at the burnout spectrum and how I think about the change you need based on which part of the spectrum you're on, think of it as little c, big c in change. So if you're in the early stages, little c, those are more preventative. If you're in the more intense stages, you might need bigger C's. That might be you need a complete job change. That might be you need a career change because what you thought you wanted to do with your life is no longer what it is. And so you keep taking these jobs that do the same role and you hate them all. That might say not just a job change, that's a career change. Same with um, if you find that you're detaching or you are super cynical and don't want to be bothered with anyone, everyone sucks, or you are uncomfortable with the amount of uh, consumption of vices. If you start to feel uncomfortable with that stuff, like that's when you, big C, you need to talk to like talk to a therapist and be like, hey, this is going on. What, understanding everything else in your situation. That's why I always go back to therapy because it's more than just this individual symptom. Those are attached to things. So when you're in the later stages, especially, that is where I'm always like, therapy is number one. Um, but you, ther therapists can't do their job if they're not doing yours. So what are you doing to be aware of what is going on? What are you doing to create those boundaries? What are you doing to create those guardrails? Because no one can fix your burnout more than you can. And so that like 
that is the, that that's the biggest thing. And it sucks and it is hard and no one likes to hear it. Cause everyone's like, what's the silver bullet girl? What can I do? Like, can I just take this bubble bath? Like you can, <laughs> you're still going to be burned out though. Like, so for me, for me and my process, what I did, it was a lot of deep introspection after trying to fight it and ignore it. So I started to assess what was going on. So I really did. I treated myself like an innovation project as cheesy as that sounds, but that was my background is what I'm familiar with. So for me, I took a step back and was like, who am I? Let me just start there. Because in the intense stages, you start to say, I don't, I may not know who I am anymore, or I'm not myself. So if you're in that, start writing it down. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Like, just write it down. And then you can start to assess, like, am I happy about what I'm writing? Are there things or gaps and what, what like that I'm not even excited to write about myself or like something's missing. Cause when you get in that stage, something might be missing like and starting to figure that out. So look where you came from, what you liked, look at what you're thinking about the future and figuring out where those gaps might be is huge. So I'm actually excited to talk about it cause I'm working on this program called Back to Bright. Um, it will be a six week holistic reset to help people stabilize. So if you're finding yourself in this place of like, I don't know what is going on. I know this ain't it, but I don't know where to go next. It, this program is all about resetting your compass and just saying, we're going to point you north so you can figure out what direction you want to go. And then you can make decisions along the way and build your team. Um, the last thing I would say as you're, regardless of where you are, you're, you didn't get into this by yourself and you can't get out, build your team. And so I talk about this thing called a burnout battle team. Why not? Um, and so the burnout battle team, I always say um, your mental health or spiritual guide, someone that grounds you, your foundational piece, a career coach. So if you decide you want to do something different, so a coach to take you there, career or wellness coach to help you build forward, understanding what hobby or wellness habit you want, you need a steam valve. You need a way to relax, let it off. So whether that's running, yoga, some fun. Like I occasionally fly kites. Like I started flying kites because I couldn't meditate because I couldn't sit still. Like what is that way that you can bring some peace to your mind or who can help you with that? So if you need a wellness guide or yoga teacher or someone to help you there, wellness is a part of your burnout battle team. And then your community, like your support system. So someone you could just go to that you're not paying, paying for, but someone that's your friend that could be there when you're feeling down and be like, I just need someone to hype me up or I just need someone to listen. So your burnout battle team is your support system as you're going through it. Okay. That was a, does that help? You were taking notes. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> listen, because even as I um, am, have left corporate America and I work for myself, especially now when we're like on a serious lockdown in Mexico city and I can't do anything. Like I wake up, I flip open the computer, I blah, 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 blah. And then it's the end of the day. And I'm still like, blah, blah, blah. So I feel myself feeling burnt out with when it's, when there is no external pressure, it's, it's just me, but I'm so used to that, that speed. Um, Yes, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say, if you're, Stephanie said, big C change, quit. Yes, if your big C change is to quit, holler at me, holler at my girl, Stephanie Perry of Vicarious. We help people quit their jobs and start adventures all the time. I'm not saying that's right for you. I'm not saying it's the perfect thing to do. I am saying if that's where you are and that's what you know you need, come through. Nope. Okay, I want to hit the comments real quick, and then I added a question for you. Let's see. Uh, Kelly says she's over here nodding in agreement. Uh, but can we go over the pillars again? Rest, play, etc. The pillars, growth. So the first pillar is growth. That's where your mental health, coaching, all that stuff starts to come in. That's internal work, deep work. Um, and I will girl, send you girl, the, the internal work. <laughs> it's so hard. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So small aside, it's funny because I have been talking about burnout for now, like a year and a half, even though everybody's acting like this shit is new. I'm yeah. I, so it's funny because the internal work is, as soon as I start talking about it, I'm like giving people advanced notice, like, oh yes, therapy isn't always fun. They won't be your friend. Like you are not going to like going to, it. and I'm like sharing this, knowing it, but I hadn't felt it yet. And I will say <laughs> this year or no, uh, <laughs> This fall winter, oh, I felt that period. And it can be trash. 
but keep going because the other side of it feels so much better. So you will not like your therapist sometimes and you will not like the feelings that you are feeling, but feel them. Like now is the time to feel them. Now is the time to make changes. We don't have no time. Like we, we don't have any time and the entire world is burning out. So please do yourself a favor and allow yourself to feel the feelings you deserve to feel. Okay. So growth. Yes, going rest. back, sorry. Growth, rest, play, community. Okay. And I will send you a link too, because these are pulled directly from, um, I, I use the mental wellness initiative and these research papers. So I can share like the foundational stuff if you want to go deeper. But growth, once again, is deeper internal work. Rest, okay. and rejuvenation, literally rest, mindfulness stuff, meditation stuff, um, sensorial, so aromatherapy, sound baths, light therapy, all of that falls into the rest place. Um, play is creativity. So I like to talk about hobbies a lot. So that's how I talk about the, the play and as well as just play, like just do some for fun. When I am talking to my coaching clients, every week I ask them four questions. What did you do um, what did you do for fun? What did you do to relax? What did you do to connect? And what did what happened last week that you're grateful for? So always make those things a priority. I know that's not a test you can fail, but I feel like a lot of weeks <laughs> I will fail that. Nope. I'd be like, so let's change the subject real quick because I don't I don't have that for you. Exactly. Um, I'm going to put the link to the uh, the link you described. I'll drop it in the description after this, so everyone else can access it. Um, back to the comments. Janelle says, I'm going through that in my current job as well as my previous job. I'm always, I'm always wrong, but then managers regurgitate my info and present it as, it, as, it, as their own. I'm going through that PIP mess now. Yes, girl. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Thank you for sharing first off. So let's think about this. So one, if it's a, if you're finding yourself in the same situation in multiple jobs, there's a couple things I would evaluate specifically for your job and whatever you're looking for next, figure out in the past ones, the stuff that you didn't like, and then make sure you're asking those type of questions to see if that is present in future jobs. So when you're interviewing, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. And when you start to assess like, oh, this is a routine or behavior I do not want to replicate, start to figure out what is there and then how can you assess it for future opportunities? Because it is trash to hop into the same situation and then two months into the job, you are like, what the, like these people are following me and that happens. Um, so assessing what one of the tools or exercises I say is like, look back at your past career and look at like, I would say, do your win wall, do your dump of everything you are proud of and accomplished, like start there. Cause when you're in these situations it can shake your confidence, um, especially in, your, in these type of workplaces. So do your win wall and then look at it and say, what did I like doing? and want more in my life? What did I not like doing? What were the things about past situations that were trash? So that you can ask pointed questions in future interviews to make sure that doesn't exist. In your current situation, start to assess, is it the individual team or is it the org? If it's the org, you might, you might need that bigger seat. It might be time to change, hence ask the questions for the next. Um, if it is a matter of your boss, are there guardrails you can put? Can you start to manage your boss, manage the communication, create new norms and expectations that allow you to breathe easier? Um, can you take your own foot off your neck? Because I, I, I don't know you, but I would imagine you are like, but I give so much. But if they're not giving it back, stop giving so much because you still get your check. So can I say that I was in that exact place and I went to my therapist and she was like, but why are you doing so much? Like why, if they mm. don't give to you, why do you give to them? And it, when she said that, as a black woman, nope. my first response was like, you crazy. Like, I don't, I, I, I don't, I can't just not be excellent. Like, what do you, what is this? <laughs> there seems to be some kind of gap between you and me because I, and then like the more she like, because we talked about some really negative situations. Mm -hmm. And she was like, they're assholes. Like, why are you trying so hard to please assholes? And she was like, can you keep your job if you give less? If, if you give the least, And because my job was ending in, in a few months anyway. And I was like, yeah. And she was like, you can still get paid. Yeah. And she was like, so why are you killing yourself? And it was until I had that moment of, when somebody else gave me permission 
Yep. I would have never given myself that permission to do beliefs on a job that I, I, was, I already knew I was getting laid off from. I already knew it was going, the whole company was going away. Yep. Like, but I was like, no, I have to, I have to give until I bleed. And she was like, or you could just collect a check. <laughs> it's like, that's not how we were raised. I'm raised like that. Like, it's always, <laughs> it's so funny, like being black in like our peer set because we've been given the books and I'm staring right at it. Like good to great, good is never enough, grit, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, thanks, but what? <laughs> but I just want to do my job sometimes. So, I just, can I, can I, can I, can I just be? But I think that whole theory of like, but I want to give excellence. Everything you're given is excellence. You just might make, want to give that excellence somewhere else. So you have one tank. And we always talk about, I'm giving 120% to this, so what else is getting anything? Because if you already given more than what you should have given, like more than your tank was available to give to this job, what about the rest of the facets of life? Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting. I get excited about this conversation now as we're like, work isn't all there is. Because being raised in a very blue collar family, like from Detroit, we were, it was very much like get good grades, go get a good job, go work said job, retire. Like, and I was never on that. And it was like, but I don't want to be miserable the entire time because you look mm -hmm. at, I looked at family, friends, sisters, and like I'm the baby of three girls. And it's just like, y'all don't seem happy. So how can we create our own rules? Like if last year taught us nothing is you can do whatever the fuck you want and still move up. <laughs> so it's a matter of what is important to you and then making your behaviors for that. So if you're like, I want to get paid, okay, is your check enough and your bonus, even if your bonus isn't hypo? Like, are you good if you get the standard bonus and your check? Because most of us are good. Like when you think about it, like in a lot of these careers, we're good, but we're always told to strive for more. Like this is not enough. Even though that ceiling is right there, trying to stop you from getting more, we're still trying to break through. Uh -huh. I'm okay with that. Like, first off, the ceiling is trash. Like, I'm, I've been doing a lot of reading of like the upper bound limits and, and some interesting things like the the big leap is this book everyone's talking about. So I'm, I'm starting to read it. But it's like how we pre create these upper bound limits on ourselves because of perceived ceilings. And so some of them are real and it works, but sometimes we just think they're limits or you mm -hmm. don't realize like you can go around that limit and expand. So maybe in your job, that's a limit. Okay, well, what's the role of that job in your life? You pay your bills. If that job is to pay your bills, why are you giving them more than that? And then find yes. other outlets that are fun, that can yes. give you more of a return emotionally. Mm -hmm. All right, some more comments. I'm not gonna name names in case they decide to delete this comment later, but one of us says they're in the cannabis stage now. They want edibles all the time to make themselves feel better. Mm -hmm. We get oh. it. Oh, I get it, yes. <laughs> Uh, yes. I, yeah, that one's hard. Okay. So here's the thing. Burnout in a normal world, there's some things like where it's like, oh, do this and it's fine. Or like you could get through it. Burnout 2020 residual, like some stuff like that is a coping mechanism. And I am always a, a, a matter of, it's a case guy, case basis. You know, if you feel uncomfortable with what you're consuming and you know, if it, you can start to understand if it's a problem to pull back or slow down. So I like to drink, but there was a point last summer where I was so, so uncomfortable with what's going on. I realized that I was just grabbing it because it was available. So I was like, I'm uncomfortable. So I went a three week hiatus and was like, okay, let me reset. And so if you start to notice those things, those things happen. Like that is actually happening across the world right now. <laughs> and, I mean, we said that uh, dispensaries were essential. So I think we're sort of creating that as well. But if that's what you need to like calm your nerves occasionally, that's fine. Like mental health professionals do even say like cannabis has studied, like you'd be okay. Drinking is that. If you hit a threshold where you start to feel uncomfortable, start to make the changes. If you re reach, a th reach a threshold where you cannot start to make changes, go get some support and talk about it. This is not new. You are not alone. This shit happens a lot. It'd be all right. But if you just like your gummies occasionally because you turned on CNN or happened to fly by Fox, Girl, pop your gummy. Enjoy it. <laughs> I'll toast to you. I'll be doing the same. Toast to you. All right. Um, do you have recommendations for, you're not a therapist, I'm saying this again, not a therapist, neither am I. Um, do you have recommendations for finding culturally competent therapists? 
So I always started therapy for black girls. I think that's a great platform. Um, it's a directory for black women therapists. Um, there are a couple other platforms. I'll see, I'll try to find some and shoot you the link shoot it so you can add them. But there's no lack of platforms right now for trying to curate black therapists. There's a lot of black therapy directories. Now, when it comes to, I always go directly to black therapists when it comes to culturally, like understanding the cultural nuances, but there are others that are doing the work. That is hard to decipher, but what I'm saying is I don't have an exact answer for you now, but I am saying that I will be doing some research on how you can vet uh, non-diverse therapists and the questions you can ask on intake to make sure that they have some awareness. Because a lot of them are do have some awareness. Um, they have to do some trainings and stuff, but there's some questions because there's personal bias. So I don't have an exact answer, I'm sorry, but I will start working on it to give some stuff. And you can, um, I put stuff up on hookywellness.com, um, the hooky handle on Instagram and my personal handle, Burnout Whisperer. So I'll be putting up this education stuff so any of these questions that come today, if I don't know it, I'll, I'll do some research and start popping up answers to help you. As I asked that question, I just realized that I've had quite a few therapists and I um, I don't think any of them have ever been black women. I've had some very, uh, very great therapists, um, but I, I don't know if it's because it was before I, where I lived or the search results that were available at the time, because this is free therapy for black girls. I don't know that I've ever seen a black female therapist. I would love to. A black, um, yeah, I, I've i only had black women therapists. Um, I've had to go through this process multiple times because keep moving. Um, my, and I would say, it just makes things easier. Like, it's just like being in a workplace. It's just <laughs> someone you can automatically catch eyes or do the side eye and they know what you're talking about. Um, so to me, it just gave me a level of comfort and one less thing I had to explain. But I also partner with white therapists, uh, other women of color, male therapists. And so that's where it gets into an individual. So I actually pose a question for you. How did you, did you vet yours or how, any, from your experience, any tips you have on like how to make sure your therapist is culturally aware? I don't know that any of them very culturally aware in the like I deal with a black woman, but for my core problem, they were very good with that. Awesome. So my blackness was something that didn't, I don't remember it coming. Well, with my, no, with my, my last therapist was Eastern European and she, with a, a very thick accent and she got the like, I know what it's like when you're treated differently because okay. of who you are. And so that was really good. One before that I went to because I was having problems at work. I worked in tech. She worked with a lot of people in tech. So it was like she had she had a competence that I needed, but it wasn't that black girl magic, um, which I will definitely be looking for next time. I just find that like when I'm traveling around, I don't want to say that I don't need a therapist because your girl does. I just haven't had a chance to, or haven't prioritized finding that one, probably because like, I'm so used, and it's weird because we're all in a situation now, but I'm used to seeing people in person. And so when I left in 2018, my therapist was like, oh no, I don't, I don't do online stuff. So goodbye, God bless. Um, and now I know she, I know she has found a way to do online stuff, yeah. <laughs> um, but I just haven't really, um, Got into that, so it's. I'm gonna make this a goal for February. I'm going to find a therapist. Find a therapist February. Yes, and when people think about like therapy, I think we automatically think, do I have to talk to this person all the time? Is it every week? Because it can add up, especially if you go out of pocket. Depending upon where you are, it might be an occasional check in. Like one of the things that I love appreciate about the process, like in the intake your therapist is assessing what's going on with you. They're asking you questions. You're asking them questions. Like you should be vetting your therapist. You should, this is a relationship and can get quite intimate. If you don't like them, you should not be talking to them. And so that first session, they're getting to know you, you're getting to know them, ask them like, 
ask them their style. What type of people do they work with? What do they like to help with? What are the areas that they don't feel as comfortable helping with? Because therapists have area of expertise as well. Like they also, there are chances where therapists will do the intake and say, oh, I'm not a match for you. And it isn't bad. It isn't any ding on you. It just be the stuff that you need to work on. They may not have the skills and expertise to do it. Like they choose specialties. They have certain uh, methodologies and psychological philosophies that can align or not align. So if your therapist says, I'm, I need to refer you out, first off, don't take it as offense because people really talk about that that can happen. But if you're starting to look for one in that intake, they'll ask you all those questions, but then they'll help you assess like how often you might need to meet um, and how long the period is. Cause you may, don't feel like it has to be overwhelming. It doesn't have to be every week. Like I go through periods where I talk to my therapist every week. And then there's periods where I'll check in with her monthly or bi-weekly. It depends on what's going on in life. So I think we talk a lot about like, get a therapist, get a therapist. And it, but what does that mean? What can it look like? Uh, I just like to touch on it. Thank you. I, I love that you have a non-black therapist. I, yeah, we'll have to talk about that offline because I'm yeah. intrigued. They're doing the work. There's not a lot of us, first off. There's not a lot of therapists. There is actually a shortage of therapists right now because everyone is realizing they want it. And then of it, I believe the stat is 14% of therapists in the U.S. are black. So yeah. I love that you don't have a black therapist because you show that that can still help because they, they go to school. Yeah. It doesn't matter, like for the most part. Listen, that woman was like, quit that job. Ooh, I like her. I was like, she was like, what? She was like, you want to go travel the world? Go do that. Quit that. And I was, I was like, first of all, as a therapist, aren't you supposed to be like asking me questions and waiting for my response? She was like, no, they're rude. You should quit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like. But you know what? Time. Without her, I might, I probably wouldn't have taken a career break. So, mm. yeah, I'm really grateful like to that. her and to that experience. Yeah, that's a real thing. And to that point, like all therapists aren't like that. I was talking to someone yesterday. He was like, she just asked me questions. They, he just asked me questions all the time. I'm like, I just need you to say yes or no. This makes sense or it doesn't make sense. Like, should I? So that's style as well. So if you like more directive style or you like people more hands-off, ask those type of questions in the intake. That is a drastic difference in style. So I have, I find most therapists I've met are not like yours. Like. But I think that's more the CB, um, CBT style, um, the more directive. Mm -hmm. If you go in the psycho, psychoanalytic, psychoanalysis, that's more long-term therapy. That's, let's talk. That's like you walk in, sit down, and then they just stare at you. Like, right. That, and that's what I expected. And she was like, none of this, none of this. Okay. So we, I told you this would be an hour and we were about halfway through our questions. You were right. And you were <laughs> I'm, we I'm talk like, okay. we talk okay so let me see if I can get through some real quick mm -hmm. um, and then get back to the comments mm -hmm. um, we talked about what people should be doing to avoid burnout in the middle of the pandemic and you talked about the, the plan the fiddly fig so I think we've covered that are is there any additional points you want to add pandemic related uh, the pandemic the whole thing with the pandemic it didn't create burnout it accelerated it um, mm -hmm. that's really the thing so as we think about the stages phases like it was just like, oh, you in stage two, are you doing well? Let's let's cook you over four. Let's completely cut out all of your coping mechanisms community and make everyone completely unaware of how to create new norms that are reasonable in this ridiculous mm -hmm. world. So when it comes to pandemic, like this is a unique thing. Like no one knows what's, how this impacts us or how to manage, everyone's making it up. Let me just say, everyone's making it up. So in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of this world, what to do is to be real and honest about what you're feeling. Like so often we are just so used to ignoring it and being like, I can work through it. I'll fix it later. It's not that bad. Shit's supposed to happen. Yes, yeah, so it's supposed to happen. Life happens. But if you got a lot of life happening, you might need to change what you're doing in the midst of it. Um, and so assessing where you are and how you've been doing and if some stuff needs to change. Because pandemic, I would say the biggest thing is how work is balancing. Ugh. Burnout is not, we talk about burnout as an individual thing most of the time. Burnout is actually individual, collective, and systematic. It is a combination of things happening at all that level, all those levels that can drive it. In this world, it is very hard to change things at a systematic level, especially now. But I think we're all aware our system, like our companies and structure and processes need to change. It's just a lot of these are large ships that need to change. And so in the middle of the pandemic, it's how do I start to take control of my sphere of influence and the things I can't control? 
So for me as a, in the workplace, it's like, what can you do in your workplace team, in your small workplace team, creating some new norms? Maybe even if your org doesn't give you, maybe they don't, they're not one of the orgs that say Fridays, no meetings. Can you do that on your team? Can you create those rules and behaviors? Are there certain times that you're like, no communication after this point, like, or I will not be responding after this point. It's hard to do that. People will side eye you and have a problem. But you know what's funny is people will also notice and be like, we can do that shit. That's what happens is you set the tone and show what's available. Can you, one of the things I talked about in my most recent session with like Google is some of the workplace dynamics of like, you get instant messengers and people expect you to respond immediately. And it was like, okay, there's stuff that happens. What piece can you control? Because when people send you IMs or Slacks or whatever, there is an assumption that that is an immediate response. That, and so it's sometimes by nature of where the communication comes from, creates an assumption of the behavior you need to do. But <laughs> we get tired of being on. So if you get IMs, can you respond to someone and say, like, is this urgent? Like, just to clarify, because sometimes people just send you an IM because they don't want to write an email, but it's not urgent but we assume it's urgent. So then we add on more stress. So right. looking at those things that are causing you stress and being like, can I change anything about this to eliminate unnecessary stress? That is what I say in the middle of the pandemic is eliminate unnecessary stress. So over communicate, creating your own norms, creating your own boundaries and doing your damnedest to hold to it because everyone around you will be fighting against it. Um, I'll use a small example of like workplace and how it can be hard to create your own thing. Like when I was, right before I left my job, um, when did I do this? In 2019, I decided to take leave. I took five weeks leave because life was trash. It was trash. <laughs> I was like a deep uh, burnout. And I, my dad was uh, not doing well at that time. And so I took five weeks and I remember I was, I was like going back and forth. Do I quit this job or do I take leave? Do I quit this job or do I take leave? Because I knew I wanted to do entrepreneurship, but I, I was scared of the money and losing that check. And it was like, maybe I could just keep holding on. I'll take this leave to refill my tank. And so one of the biggest moments that changed how I felt about giving to everyone else was that moment I started to communicate to my coworkers I was taking leave. So I was on this team. They're all spazzing because they spaz. They don't they didn't have a ton of organization. So I came into this new role and I was, I shouldn't have taken it, but I was like, I decided to take leave, talk to my boss. My boss is like, all right, cause there's nothing they could say. It was just like, make a plan. So I'm having this with my core cross functionals. And I'm like, hey, I'm taking leave. Here's the plan of how my projects will be allocated. Who's can do what? Like I went over and above as always, even mm -hmm. though I was the one that needed the healing, but I laid out your project plan. I will be gone. Here's everything. I just work my ass off to get you set. In this meeting where I am telling you that I am taking leave because I need to take a leave and because my father is being sick and I am super stressed the fuck out and I can't do anything, you have the nerve to come back to me about how you stressed out and how is shit gonna get done in the next five weeks? At that moment, I decided to choose me from now on. And so I think we all have those moments in the workplace and just pay mm -hmm. attention to it because your healing comes first and ain't nothing else anybody else can do to heal for you. And if they try to be assholes about it, that's when you know some shit needs to change. And that might not be the org or the team for you. And so in the midst of it, in the midst of it all, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's personal chaos, whether it's life lifing, whether it's just racial bullshit, it's what bubble can you create around yourself what boundaries can you create and how can you do what you need to do for you because those other people may not be there yeah they are not there for you they I won't so be they are that. not they will not be um helpful i want to get back to our questions because i hope you didn't have a hard stop because no. girl all right are black women impacted by burnout differently than other people yes like just stop it there. Yes. So burnout does not discriminate, but it does have favorites. Um, that's <laughs> wait, y'all, wait. Write that down. All y'all, write that down. I'm on page three now. Oh, good. I like Ooh. it. Um, yeah, it doesn't discriminate, but it does have favorites. So it's interesting in the studies of burnout, I'm excited to see more work done in the people of color space because there's not a lot, as you could imagine. But they do recognize like, it is harder for people of color and especially harder for women. A lot of it is just a natural draw to overcommitting and to 
uh, doing two times as much work or hard working two times as hard or being good to great. Like that nature and how we're conditioned, how we've been trained, like that just sets us up to be more susceptible to burnout. That if you, especially like even, especially women, like we have a nurturing spirit. So those people who are used to giving more, um, that bites you in the butt in the workplace that's used to taking. And so for black women, we are in these situations where just by nature of who we are as a giving being, as a commitment, as a trying to make things feel better, when you're in those situations where they don't recognize you, where they don't reward you, where you get overlooked and they're constantly giving you what I call workplace paper cuts every day. Um, yeah, that's, that, that is what makes um, black women burn out faster um, because we're used to giving. And so, yeah, yeah, we are. It's one of the things I say is like, it's really interesting. We're used to this metaphor, we're used to sweating. We are used to sweating and working our asses off. And so what we don't realize is that there is a point where you're, you're instead of wiping sweat from your brow, you're wiping blood from your brow because it's just constant paper cuts that are happening over time. And so it's, um, I would say black women are, likely to get in that burnout because we're used to wiping the sweat, but we just don't recognize when it turns to blood. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yes. And it was <laughs> deeper than I expected. It, it's, it's 10 o'clock here. That was pretty deep for 10 o'clock. Well, I was thinking, yeah. I was like, Ooh. I'm on this like paper cut thing because you just get so used to it and you're like, I'll ignore it. It's fine, mm -hmm. it's whatever. I was just thinking back to the main job that triggered this. And I was just like, that was horrible. Like you just look back like, what the fuck? And then like how it can cascade and how it can affect your entire sense of confidence, ability, like I've, yeah, this has been a journey and it is bullshit and no one should be able to take your joy from you. And so just bringing this type of awareness, be like, stop wiping that sweat. They don't deserve it, girl. Definitely. And I always say that, um, should we talk about like dating, like, when I was burned out and unhappy, I'm sure I'm a lovely woman, damn it. But I'm sure I was no prize to date. Cause like, because who you are at work and how that stress manifests itself, you don't get to turn it off at five, six, seven, eight o'clock whenever you get to leave. Like if you, that is shit is coming with you and it is entering your relationships, personal, with family, with dating. Like I wasn't happy at work, so I wasn't happy everywhere. Yep. Are we not eating pizza tonight? Like it's everything. It was just, just mad, just mad, just mad, just mad because like I was mad at work and there was nothing I could do about it. And also one of the things you said before, like it's the layers. It's that like one thing one day and then you, there's another little layer of crazy the next day. Another like, did that bitch just say that the next day? And then it's just like, well, she did. And then you started here and you're up here and you just don't know what to. Yeah. You don't see a lot of times. I, I know for me, I didn't see it coming. It was just like one day I went to my therapist and I was like, this is what they said in the meeting. And she was like, mm, girl, <laughs> why are you doing this? I, like it needed, I needed someone else to be like, no, this is I've been so used to it that I, I had that third person who was like, you can still get a check if you don't do shit. Don't grow what? Like, why are you, nope. why, why are you letting them talk you crazy? And I was like, oh, cause I show up to work and that's how they talk. Cause they're crazy. And I try, not, I'm trying not to internalize it. She's like, but you, you are, cause we're here talking yeah. about it. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Then it get through. Okay. Krishan says, then you wonder why you allowed it. That internal negative dialogue needs to stop. Yes. We blame ourselves too when it happens. Woo. Must be you, okay. right? Like, it must be you. Like, it there must are it must be, it must be, I must be crazy. Uh, oh, no, no, crazy. not. <laughs> uh, Gypsy Publisher says she was diagnosed with stage four cancer and it still took a year to say enough. The stress is real and manifests itself in so many ways. Yes, y'all. Yes. So, sending you love, Gypsy Publisher. I hope everything is okay with you now and you've recovered. But yes, you let that stuff, that work stress get to you. And then all of a sudden it's your health and they don't give a damn. Yeah. Once again, they get you sick and they don't give a damn. Yeah, we think it all just stays in our mind, but I'm glad she brought that up because like your burnout manifests once again, mental, physical, and emotional. So your symptoms really can be like you, if you take the physical route, your symptoms can go from 
back stress to stomach pains to all of a sudden you're dealing with chronic illnesses like mm -hmm. that's the thing that's burnout that's stress that's any type of mental health condition that you do not acknowledge like over time that can turn into other things with intensity and so burnout is one of the things that does not get better by ignoring it and so that connection between mind body we so often overlook how not doing something about what you're dealing with how it can turn into something more severe so yes i pray that you are doing uh, much better. I am not saying that burnout caused cancer by any means. So please no one take that one. But um, when it comes to physical well being, like mm -hmm. it, how stress can impact you there, I just want to bring attention because we often overlook that. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, are there micro changes you recommend that people facing burnout implement? And I want to preface this with a lot of times when people come to me, they are at the end of the rope and they're like, I'm going to quit my job. And I'm either gonna sit on my couch or I'm gonna chop my world because I cannot go back into these people anymore. Nope. And so, yes, I am here for you with open hands. Come, let's talk. let me hold your hand and walk you through like your new adventure through the world. But rewind, before mm -hmm. you get to the point where it's like, I'm gonna cuss all these people out <laughs> and quit the job right after I get my bonus. Like <laughs> before we get to that point, before yep. you gotta shake a table, are there micro changes that they can make in their life so that if they are, if they know they're leaving their job or they know they're taking a career break six months from the point where they realize they are burned out and they need a new plan, what can they do in that time when they're still at the job that's burning them out individually? What can they do individually to, um, to better cope mm -hmm. and to, in that space? Yep. Um, yes. So, you started with, what was your initial question? Um, micro changes. Micro okay. changes while they're still in the zone, before they get to that big C quit, they need to make small C changes, whatever changes they can. I hate my boss, I hate going to work, but I have to for another six months. What are the micro changes they can do inside of work, outside of work to make that time more bearable? Yep. Thank you for repeating it. Um, absolutely. I love the micro changes. Like that's the whole thing with my company, Hooky Wellness. Like when you look at how people have dealt with burnout um, in the past, people often reserve their mental health repair for long vacations or retreats or sabbaticals. Like we often save up our time to take a break. Um, but these everyday lifestyle behaviors or taking hooky days every so often are really what will help you sustain over time um, uh, yeah, because you shouldn't be going into a sabbatical or vacation like completely exhausted. Like then you're sleeping, you're not even enjoying the money that you're spending. So when it comes to those micro behaviors, one, I always say the pillars, it's always the four pillars. What are the things that you can pull from the four pillars into your everyday life? So um, when it comes to growth, okay, say for instance, you're good on therapy, you already have that, but you're like, I wanna leave this job and I cannot afford to take a sabbatical, but I need to do something different career coach, let's make a plan for what's what's in the future, helping assess like what you want to do, what you don't want to do, where you want to go and like creating that actual tactical plan to that. When it comes into the rest, rest rejuvenation, like taking a break, creating guardrails and actually taking a break. So a hooky day every so often, even if you can't take the three weeks, literally take a day. I'm all about hooky days. I have a annual campaign the third Tuesday of every, of third Tuesday of October for the past two years we have celebrated cookie day. We're working professionals take the day off and repurpose it for self-care. It's a random math Tuesday. That's exactly why I do it right before the holidays. This is a behavior you should do throughout life. And so if you can't do it every month, because that can be a drastic jump, what's your hooky day every quarter? What day are you just going to take off for you not to do work, not to, not to do work, but just to do whatever the fuck you want to do. So whether that's connected with a friend and have a brunch on a Tuesday, I'm all about that. Whether that you want to have a picnic, whether that you want to go to the spa, whether that you want to binge on a random weekday, take your hooky days quarterly is what I will say at a minimum. That's a way to, to continue to refill your tank. And then the rest in the play, finding a hobby, finding something you do for fun, not for money. It sounds funny in this day and age, but like for real, like everything should be money. It sucks the life out of it. Um, so finding something you will do for fun, something that makes you smile, something that makes you laugh. So think about those hobbies you did as a kid. Like, what were those teams you were on? What were those hobbies you like? What was that thing that's always been on your Pinterest board that you're like, one day you're sitting at home. Like, 
you have more time than you've ever had, pick it up, try it out. It does suck right now because all places aren't open, but how can you try out that hobby at home? So that's one, that's what I would say on it every day. And then the last is the community. So how does that pillar come in? Make sure you're checking in with people. Like, even though, I don't know about you, I have a small quarantine crew, like small, certain people that I see um, certain in real life. Like I hit up my two girls yesterday and was like, I need to be around people. We just, I am lucky I'm in North Carolina and this weather is pretty amazing. Like we were able to go on the roof and like hang out on the roof for like two hours and just be around people. So those are the types of things on an everyday basis you should be doing to keep burnout either at bay or to start to reverse some of those trends. But those are small lifestyle things. You can bring them in. Find the version of each of those pillars that you like. Because there is no, like, as I said, no silver bullet. There's no like one-stop shop for burnout. Use these four pillars for what is most authentic to you. That is really, really helpful. And I shared your company name again. Tisha says that she just took a hooky day on Tuesday and went to the ancient thermal bath in Chicago. Oh, wait, you say in Chicago? Yeah. Ooh, we'll have to talk. I wonder, did did you go to the Korean spa or did you go to air? I used to live in Chicago. I saw something about air this week online and I'm not sure if on like Instagram, I'm not sure if it was Latisha or someone else who posted it, but I saw someone post about air just this week and I'd never heard of it before. It's dope. I want to make one or my version of it. I, okay. Yeah. All right. So we talked about micro changes, but you also talked about how burnout is collective um, mm-hmm. and it starts like in these workplaces. So what are workplaces doing about burnout in ways that in, like tangible things that you've seen work, workplaces doing about burnout and what else should they be doing? Hmm. What are they doing? Not enough. Uh, So that's one. So it's really interesting. There's a stat that says only 56% of employees were saying employers are not actually encouraging conversations about burnout. Um, A large part of that is they don't know how to have them because this is a lot of individual mm, emotional stuff, internal work. So it's hard to broach it in the workplace. What they've been doing you know, your usual yoga class in the middle of the office for free or amping up your wellness benefits. So in the positive, they are amping up wellness benefits. If you have a company that is giving you benefits, use your benefits. Let's say it again. No, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. How many times do I tell y'all, read that manual and get everything? Yes. Everything. Come for it. Everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right now. Don't abuse your benefits, but use your benefits. Like... If you need it, that's why they're here. Like companies get annoyed and they're paying all this money and then no one uses it and then it goes away. And then you're looking at your benefit books the next year, like, oh, what happened to that thing? I was meant to do it. No one used it. So that benefit's gone. So use your benefits. So whether that's free mental health resources, whether that's an EAP program where that can help you find a therapist, even if they don't pay for it, whether that's different well being apps or incentive programs or days off, if your company gives it to you, use it. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've heard companies giving people days off or they'll be like no meeting days or this and then people still work. Um, so don't do that. And if you are a people manager, you are setting the tone for your people. So if you are taking a day off, take your day off, do not send emails. Because if you are taking a day off sending emails, you're setting the tone and the expectation for your direct reports that they should be doing the same. So recognizing you can set the tone if you have a direct report and you can set the tone in a pretty cool way right now because companies are trying to figure it out. And if you're like, hey, this is for the mental health of my team, let them argue with you. Like if you're still delivering, you'll be all right. So playing with the rules right now, using your resources. Now, when it comes to the workplace team, one of the biggest things is having the conversation and um, stop acting like burnout doesn't exist because as we were talking about walking around like an exposed nerves, we have an entire workplace of walking around like exposed nerves, bumping into each other, pissing each other off, causing the cascade of passive aggressive emails because something went awry in the beginning because everyone is an exposed nerve. Like the bullshit you're dealing with, people are dealing with their own version of it. Like we don't always bring it all to work. So I've started doing a workshop called Navigating Burnout. I support workplace teams. I go in 60 minute session. What is burnout? What it is, what it isn't and what you can start doing about it. So I'm very practical. <laughs> I'm very tactical. So I work with high performance teams. So I've done these sessions with a couple of workplace teams at Google. Um, I work with the MBA program at Indiana University. Um, and there's a couple other conversations going but it's all about setting a tone in a common language. Cause right now everyone is like walking on eggshells 
and not addressing it, but everyone's uncomfortable and everyone's getting pissed in their own little bubbles. And so what I get excited about going into these is being, I, I don't know about you, but like my bank account went set up so I could do my career break for quite a while. And so I needed to work in a sense until I build up the fuck it fun, but like I needed to work. And so if you're in that situation where you're like, I need to keep working, but what's happening right now ain't going ain't gonna to cut it. We need to create some new norms and behaviors. Holla at your girl. I'm able to come in. I can quickly assess and highlight some of the things that are happening on the team in a uh, external viewpoint by not calling out people, but highlighting unnecessary stress behaviors across the team and encouraging and creating this change in behavior. So I was really excited in the last session uh, that I did with Google. People walked away and said they felt they had a better understanding of burnout symptoms. They could identify them in their lives and they felt equipped to do something about them and inspired to build, bring in more mental wellness behaviors into their life. So if you are looking to bring in some education and create a new norm and like spark some changes in conversation on your team, uh, hit me up. Uh, you can DM me at Burnout Whisper or go to hookywellness.com. Um, I do have a one pager that you can share to your HR, your ERGs, your, um, your people managers. I come in, I'm the voice of the people because we cannot keep doing things like we have done. We need to start having some real conversations and setting some sparks to change behavior. Um, so really excited about the workplace things because we're beyond the only individual approach. The whole workplace, the whole world, like quick step in a normal world, in a normal world, 77% of the professional workforce was reporting feeling burned out on an annual basis. That is 92 million people full-time work employees, 92 million people on an annual basis before 2020. Yet we are acting like burnout is new and we're the only ones going through it. And so we have to come at it as a collective. They have to be new norms because if we don't start changing behaviors, we're just gonna keep repeating the cycle over and over. And so workplace stuff is super important. It can be uncomfortable to talk about it, but starting to talk about it in your smaller teams of like, hey, we need to change something and like starting small, that's what you can, what you can do. And if you wanna have bigger, I'll, I'll come help have that conversation. So are you able to help people? Cause I think if I was still working, I would need some help about how to frame this for my boss because if I didn't do it exactly the right way, she would probably accuse me of like telling her she's terrible. So it would, uh -oh. it would be a thing if I didn't do this the right way. So do you, are you able to help employees figure out how to broach their, um, their teams with this? Great question. Um, yes, and I will get even better and create a little template that you can use. And I'll put that, in. I'll create that. Thank you for the ideas. Gotta love when yeah. you're in the plane as you're flying it. So I'm like, mm -hmm, yep, I will. You can do it. Cause I tell you a boss I had years ago would have been like, but what do you say? You're not happy here. So you don't want to be here anymore. And I'm like, no, I just want you to stop this, this thing you do where like you don't listen and then you, you get loud. Like those are the only two options. Like you gotta stop that. So um, yeah, that is not the way in to bringing you up to your boss and be like, uh, you might be trash. And so I want this lady to right. tell you. <laughs> um, no, it is more of an introduction of the sense that burnout is taking over the world and mm -hmm. work and we need to understand it. So we as a team can work as a collective to fight it because the expectations of your teams aren't changing, but everyone needs to carry their load. So we're all in this together and it's time we act like it. And the interesting thing about bringing this conversation in is everyone's feeling it. It's just not as many people aren't talking about it. So if you bring up burnout to your boss and be like, hey, I've been hearing a lot of people talk about burnout. I think like our team, we've been having, like we've been feeling it. There's, I've, there's this woman that does this workshop that starts to talk about it that can give us a quick one-on-one -on -one that can help us walk away, understand it, create a new language and start to do something about it. Like that is the entry. That is how you talk about it on your boss. We know that we're gonna talk about some stuff that's happening on your team and bring it to the light. So just for your knowledge, how I bring it up is that there's this one book where I talk about unnecessary stress because that is huge. Mm -hmm. Burnout exists and then we accelerate it or amplify it. Unnecessary stress is both. And so what I like to do is understand some of those behaviors of unnecessary stress that are happening on that team. And then I bring them up in that. 
So common ones that happen are like fire drills for people who like to make fire drills unnecessarily. That is an accelerator of burnout that affects everybody on your team. But if they, people don't think about it like that, that and they don't recognize that their fire drills are actually their standard of behavior, nothing changes. So how do we bring some of those things that happen on a common workplace behavior thing, as well as some of those things that are unique nuances to your, to your team or org. So um, yes, I will be creating a template that you can use for an email. Thank you for that uh, nugget okay. question. <laughs> um, okay, if you have a question that you want Irena to answer, but we haven't gotten to yet, please drop it again in the comments. I'm going to get any last ones, but right now I want to say thank you so much, Irena, for being with us. I've dropped your company name, Hookie Wellness's IG, and your personal IG. I think you're a very great resource, and I want to invite everyone watching this right me, with me to join, what I call it? Find a therapist February. Come on, if you're gonna do it, raise your hand in the comments, let me know. Find a therapist February. Let's do this as a team, because I'm tired yeah. of being tired, of being tired of the same thing. I love um, them. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, we'll get some resources to help you with that too. Yes. So. Come on, join me if you don't have a therapist already. We're doing this. And Irena is not a therapist, but she is my go-to girl for burnout. So I'm so glad that uh, that you are here. Leticia says, if your organization is working towards health equity, it's appropriate to play the race card. Wait, and I'm like, yep, yes. If they are working towards health equity, but are they? Some of y'all are. Leticia, her workplace sounds not. I don't want to say it sounds like heaven because <laughs> to me, no workplace is, but she's got some good benefits and I think some good people over there. Francine is joining the team. We are finding therapists in February. We will have resources. Um, I dropped the link to therapy for black girls, but if it, let me drop that again. So let me go to and type and talk. Woohoo! And just a quick note on other resources. So these aren't specific uh, multicultural resources, but psychology today is always the first stop for finding a therapist. Like it's standard. You can Google your uh, zip code and, or not Google, but you can search by your zip code and then they have images, their areas of expertise and the therapist available. And they usually do uh, note if they're, op they're taking new clients because that's a big thing. So psychology today is always a good place to start. Um, we said therapy for black girls and then with your companies, your EAP program. So read your book, as you said, but EAP there, your, your wellness benefits could be in different places. EAP programs can help you find a therapist. Sometimes your benefits will pay for your therapist. Um, sometimes there'll be other resources. So reading your manual can also help you with find a therapist February. Cause finding is the hard part. The processes can be the hard part. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. This is, I'm like, jazz. you just made my Saturday. I'm like, go break and do some stuff outside. I don't know what, but I gotta right go. Now. <laughs> all right. And she said we should all get outside. So, you know, you don't if forget you, that either. Yes. Even if it's for 10 minutes, like getting some fresh air can make a huge difference, especially we've been stuck in the house. Um, but I love it. So I will, on Monday on hookywellness.com, you'll be able to take the quiz to help you understand, start understanding your personal burnout situation. Um, and there will be more tools and resources that I will keep providing. Um, I will follow up with you to help create the some support for finding a therapist uh, February. I love that idea. I'm excited. So Rashida, I'll be talking to you. Um, I know, right? And then also I would love, I do have a store, livehookie.com because it's more than just a mindset. It is a lifestyle. Um, so you can get all the cool anti-burnout gear is what I'm calling it. Like my anti-burnout shirt, um, uh, back has self-care instructions. So I love it. You'll have to check it out. Ooh, it does. Mm -hmm. I, it's weird for me to try to show you right now, but I am going to do it. I, I get it. So it's all across the back. So oh, okay. It looks like washing machine instructions. Exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So okay. Little... Thank, Thank you for joining us. Um, Callie noted that. Um, some insurances are waiving copay due to COVID. So Thank you. something else good to think hey, about. I'll tell you that. That'd be great. Get up my insurance company and do some cross-checking. Yes. Seriously, like talk, it sounds easy. If if you 
bring, if you are a people manager, go to your HR. If you're on their team, go to your manager. But trying to have HR do presentations about benefits is super helpful because they send you those emails and no one reads those emails because it's overwhelming. But go to the source and see if they will sit down with 30 minutes with your team and be like, hey, can you give us a quick rundown? of what we have, because that research is a pain in the ass and you've got other stuff to do. See if the people who are closest to it will give a quick rundown for your team as a recap. Like these resources go here, simple and sweet. No more reading a whole bunch of books and pamphlets. Like see if you can get it from the horse's mouth to make your life easier. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the ladies on the live in YouTube, I know you can't see those, but they are very grateful. Thank you for being here longer than she was like, 30 minutes 45 and I was like no we we can cut it at an hour but it's not going to be under an hour and we were at 90 minutes so but people want to talk about this topic it's really important and I'm glad you were here you're a wealth of information and so people if you're having this problem if you're feeling it hit her website find ways that you can get her into your company and try to get some make some differences at the source. Now, I know when you're feeling burned out, adding something else to do to your list of things to do at the place you don't, you already don't wanna be can feel <laughs> like a lot. Um, it is. Now, you're, now you're pushing up that boulder up the hill with one hand. But if this is something that can greatly benefit your team and yourself and, and reduce the size of that rock, I recommend that you try to do it. So. Thanks again, Irena. Everyone, um, get to her website, follow her on IG, and we will talk. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Of course. Make sure you take your hooky day, too. I will take my hooky day eventually. My mom was like, I've been here for weeks, and we don't hang out. And I'm like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That sounds like another day, another conversation. <laughs> I think she's watching this right now. So, hi, mom. Love you.